Okay, I wonder if we could turn in our Bibles again to the Gospel of John and the 20th chapter, please. And we're going to begin reading in verse 19, uh, just for the sake of context. We did look at 19 and 20 uh, last time, but uh, just to make sure we get the context. And I'm going to read to verse 31. And we're still on resurrection ground. And our topic today is going to be basically Thomas and his great confession of faith. Uh, So I guess we could say Thomas no longer doubting. So beginning in verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within. And Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, And behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. So we're we're on resurrection ground. And actually, uh, this uh, appearance of the Lord Jesus to the disciples minus Thomas is really the the end of a busy, busy first Lord's Day morning. Uh, It's been a a very busy, or Lord's Day, should we say. It's been a very busy day. There's been five resurrection appearances that first Lord's Day. And I want to just kind of by way of review, just run through them. Uh, not all of them are covered by John, but it's it's kind of interesting to put the synopsis of them together. And so the first one, actually, uh, first time the Lord appeared uh, to someone uh, was Mary Magdalene. We looked at this last time in John 20 and verses 11 through 18. That was the the first time that he had appeared to anyone uh, as far as scripture, the scriptural account uh, gives us. And then if you look back to Matthew 28, uh, we will notice in Matthew chapter 28 uh, that he appeared as well to the other women. And so that will be Matthew 28 and verses 9 and 10, where we read this. And so he's first, we've said, appeared uh, to uh, Mary Magdalene and verse 9 and 10, it says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that you go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And so he appears to Mary, appears to the women, uh, the other women. And then there's an appearance to Peter. 
that we, we don't really know too much about, other than we have a couple of remarks to say that he did appear to Peter personally. And uh, no doubt that would have been quite a, an event where it kind of uh, kept from all the details, but we do know that he appeared to Peter. Uh, verse uh, chapter, Luke 24, chapter, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 24, verse 34 says this, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And again, if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, we'll get a verification of this appearance to Peter that, again, John doesn't give us any details of. <clears throat> Luke doesn't, other than that brief statement. Paul, as he reiterates resurrection proof, he says, uh, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. And then, of course, uh, after appearing to Peter, he appeared to those on the road to Emmaus. And in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, we're very familiar with it. Uh, Luke 24, verse 13 through 32, we have that appearance. I'm not going to take the time to read it all. We're very familiar with it. Uh, but it tells us, behold, two of them, verse 13, went that same day uh, to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And so that brings us back to our passage, which is the fifth of his resurrection appearances that first Lord's Day morning when he appears to the disciples minus Thomas. And again, it's just remarkable, really. The first Lord's Day was a busy day. I remember when I first became a Christian, and of course, we often say that Sunday is supposed to be the kind of the Christian Sabbath, which it really is not true, because I found it was anything but a rest day. Uh, it seemed to be meetings all day long and uh, hospitality. And it, uh, the Lord's Day is a busy day. And it always has been since this first Lord's Day, a day full of activity. But what marks it out is spiritual activity, activity connecting ourselves with the one who died, was buried and is risen again and just focusing our lives and attention on him. And so in this passage, uh, back in chapter 20, verse 19, it says that same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled to fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be unto you. So he appears in their midst. He proclaims peace to them in the midst of all the turmoil they were going on, uh, was going on in their lives. Uh, we also observed that uh, he didn't, uh, the doors were locked, the people were in there because of fear, and yet that was not a limitation to the Lord's new resurrection body. No difficulty for him whatsoever. He was enabled uh, by his new resurrection body to walk through uh, walls and appear in the midst of his disciples. And he proclaims peace to them in the midst of this turmoil. Verse 20, when he had said this, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What a gladdening sight to see a glimpse of the resurrected Christ and to see uh, those wounds in his hands and his side. And so, again, what an affirmation, that confirming to them this is no phantom. Uh, this uh, is the same Jesus that they saw crucified. Uh, he has the, the imprints there to prove that it's him. And so definitely not the same body in the sense of uh, it, in same in sense of its composition in that it is able to pass through walls and yet the same connect and connection to that body in that uh, it was uh, very clearly had the evidence of what he had experienced in his physical body is in this new resurrection body, but there's a connection with the old body as well. And so it says in verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. And again, isn't it wonderful in the midst of the turmoil of life and the trials of life, the only one that really can bring peace to our troubled souls 
is the Lord Jesus. And he reiterates once again, peace be unto you. The peace that he gives and he alone can give. The world can't give it. It doesn't know anything of this peace. Only he can give it. And then what an encouragement to them in the midst of all of their going through and their failures, uh, because they've, they all forsook him and fled, as we understand. And um, uh, so basically, the Lord uh, shows that he still has confidence in these individuals, uh, despite their failures. And what does he say? He, he says unto them, uh, <clears throat> commissioning them again, as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. And I think this is really encouraging, right? They've, they've, they've all, not just Peter, uh, of course, we know Peter because he denied him with oaths and cursings and uh, was, was bragging beforehand that if everybody else uh, bombed out, he wouldn't. But nevertheless, it says they all forsook him and fled. And so every one of these men had let down the Lord in some way or another. But he, one thing about the Lord Jesus, which is wonderful, he doesn't give up on people. He doesn't say, okay, you're done. I'm finished with you. No, what does he do? He pro proclaims peace to them, and then he recommissions them. He uh, once again says to them, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And so what a wonderful thing, the, the measure of confidence he still had in these men, despite their failures. And it's good to know that because who of us haven't failed? Who of us have not disappointed the Lord and disappointed ourselves in, in our failure to, to live up uh, to our testimony? And the Lord would say to us today, no matter what we've done or however we failed, he would still say to us, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I still have a work for you to do. Uh, if, if the Lord only had perfect men to work with, then there'd only be one person that he ever used, and that would be the Lord Jesus. But he has the weak and foolish things of this world, men who fail, men who disappoint, uh, men who don't live up to their promises. This is who the Lord has to work with, and he does indeed recommission them. And then in verse 22, recognizing the difficulty of the task that is before the disciples, he recognizes that this new commission that they've been given would require special power. And so it says, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, this has caused somewhat of a great difficulty to many believers. What, what actually was going on here? It's clearly not the Pentecostal uh, giving of the Holy Spirit to become that permanent indweller uh, that the Lord had promised. Uh, the Holy Spirit's with you and shall be in you. It, it's not the, uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit as that permanent indweller. How do we know that? Well, it's just a couple of reasons we know that it isn't. Let's just look back, please, to John 7 for a moment. John 7, verse 37, very well-known passage. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly or out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And so the giving of the spirit would come after his ascension into glory uh, when he would be glorified just as the father he'd pray to the father and said father glorify me with the glory that i had with thee before the world was when the lord ascended to glory after that every time the lord appears after his ascension he appears in his glorified form uh, so glorious that john 
fell on his face as a dead man. The apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus fell on his face and was blinded at the sight of his glory. And so uh, his glorification was in connection with his ascension. And so that's after the ascension, we can expect the fulfillment of this giving of the spirit. And so what, what do we have here in this passage? Well, the Lord had promised them that he wouldn't leave them as orphans. And there would be a period he would, he would be with them, appearing amongst them for 40 days. But after that 40 days, there'd be another 10-day period where they would be basically left alone before the another comforter would be given, this giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so what he's doing here is he is making sure that they're not orphaned during this waiting period. And so it says he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, how, what form this took, how this, but the, the implication is he's not a permanent indweller, but the Holy Spirit is given to them during this period uh, where they, they wouldn't be orphans to enable them and to strengthen them during the 10 days between his ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And it was, of course, a token, if you like, or a symbol of what they would receive in glorious fullness on the day of Pentecost. Now, just another couple of things that I I think are of great interest. Notice uh, it says he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. I don't know if that brings anything to your mind, but it takes me back to Genesis and the original creation. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, very familiar words, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so the, the original creation of man, there's a breathing into him from God uh, of life, if you like, divine life. Uh, that gives him life, that enables him to function, uh, that, that makes him uh, real and living. And now we're moving into the new creation era. And the new man in the new creation would, would be like the old man in a sense that the breath of God would also be breathed into them, giving them this new spiritual life that would enable them and empower them, especially to do this task that had been given to them. And of course, this task is being sent uh, by the Lord Jesus as his representatives, as the Father sent me to, uh, the Lord Jesus came to represent the Father, to reveal the Father. We have been sent to represent the Son and to, as it were, reveal the Son to man. And we would need that special empowerment. And again, it brings us back to this uh, simple truth, really, that we need to reaffirm over and over again how desperately we need the power and enabling of the Holy Spirit in our life and service. Uh, In our own strength, we can do nothing. Uh, we need divine enabling to do this work, to be involved in the Great Commission. Uh, we have to have divine power. And it's interesting that as you look at all the uh, occurrences of the Great Commission uh, in the New Testament, all of them have accompanied with them the promise of his presence and his power. In other words, I'm not sending you to do this task alone. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to be with you. And so what an encouragement it is for us to know that we do not do this in our own strength, our our own energy. And so what is this commission that they have been given? Well, it's to represent Christ, but it is specifically uh, to represent him as the one who alone can forgive the sins of men. And so notice verse 23, it says, whoever sins ye remit, they're remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, it's not conferring kind of the power of popery 
on these individuals, uh, you know, within the Catholic system, uh, the the priest. I remember going to confession, and and he, uh, with a power given to me, I absolve you of your sins. He would say, and of course, he had no power to forgive me of my sins, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, and 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 because they will base it on this verse, but this is a misunderstanding completely of this verse. It's not about conferring pulpery power, but it's really simply saying this, is that this forgiveness of sins is directly related to the preaching of the gospel, that as these newly commissioned disciples go out and preach the gospel message in the power of the Holy Spirit, and what is their message? Their message is this, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and, and that they'll be forgiven of their sins, so to speak. And whoever listens to their message and believes their message, their sins will be remitted. Whoever rejects their, mes- their message, their sins will be retained. And so we don't uh, provide forgiveness, we proclaim it. Uh, again, we, we don't provide it, we announce it. We announce that, that men can be forgiven of their sins. And what, on what basis? On the basis of Christ's work, his propitiatory work on the cross, his, his work of dying as the sin bearer uh, for, uh, for, for men. Yeah, and so that's, that's our re- responsibility. It, it's to proclaim the gospel, to announce salvation is available. And basically, all who believe that are, will be forgiven. All who reject that, their sins will be retained. And instead of having Christ pay the penalty for their sin, they themselves will have to pay the penalty for all eternity for their sins in the lake of fire. And so, our responsibility in the power of the Spirit of God, is to go out and proclaim the gospel message to men and proclaim that that forgiveness of sins. Men can have a relationship with God. Their sins can be forgiven. They can have a new beginning, a new start, a new life. And uh, what a message it is. And, of course, how that message needs to be preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, with eternal consequences. Uh, again, those that believe that message, their sins are eternally forgiven. Those who reject that message, they retain their sins for all eternity. And so what a, what a message it is and what a, a need there is of Holy Ghost preaching of the gospel message in our day. Uh, men who are endued with power from on high, who preach a Christ crucified, buried, risen, and the possibility that through him, their sins can be remitted. And so what a message we have. We want to move on now to the main thrust of our section today, and that is the story of Thomas. Uh, We often call him Doubting Thomas. Uh, We'll maybe review uh, that title a little bit today uh, and ask, is it a correct title for him? And so it says in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So first thing we would say is that uh, he's Thomas the twin. That's what Didymus means. And so he's the twin. Now, we, we have no idea if he was twinned with one of the other disciples. Uh, we don't know that. We have no idea who his twin was, uh, but he's, he's a twin brother. And uh, he's one of the 12, and he's called the twin. And in many ways, what we could say is that there's there's wonderful pictures uh, in the story of Thomas um, illustrating greater truths. In one sense, there's there's a dispensational view that we can see for Thomas, that Thomas is really, in a sense, a bit like Israel. Right now, they're in unbelief, but in a coming day, it says they're going to look on him whom they have pierced, and they'll mourn and all the rest of it, and they'll be converted, and they'll acknowledge that he is God, 
manifest in flesh. They'll say, my Lord and my God. And so in a sense, Thomas is a, a picture of Israel in a coming day. But there's also an individual aspect to it too. <clears throat> because again, we have somebody <clears throat> like all of us, maybe we don't know who Thomas's twin is because we're all a bit like Thomas. And there's times when unbelief grips our hearts. And uh, we, uh, it's almost like we feel like we need more proof at times. And the Lord is very gracious in meeting us where we are. And the Lord is very gracious at restoring us. And he's going to do that with Thomas. Thomas is going to be fully restored, just as we're going to see a lot of restoration. Thomas, Peter, uh, isn't it wonderful we can say, he restoreth my soul. And all of us from time to time need that. We need him coming alongside and getting us back on our feet and back in the, in the battle. So, Thomas. <clears throat> First thing we notice about him is that when the disciples were gathered together, he wasn't with them. He was absent. He failed to attend. And it's just an interesting observation because oftentimes today there's a tendency, and I'm not talking about the COVID situation because that's a different thing, but there is, although it certainly can be linked, but there's a tendency for people to say, oh, I don't need to go to the gathering of the saints uh, because um, I can worship at home and uh, I'll be fine at home. And there's that tendency, even though the scripture says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, it's interesting that when the Lord appeared, he appeared in the midst of the gathered company here. He didn't go to Thomas's house. He, he, he appeared where the saints were gathered together. And I wonder sometimes what we miss when we're not at the meeting. For one thing, there's certain things I often used to say when my children were younger to them that uh, when we go to the meeting, there's, there's reasons for that. One is the Lord's there. He's promised where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. And obviously in a, in a different sense, I know he's everywhere present, but there's a sense in which he delights to presence himself amongst his people when they're gathered together in his name. So the Lord's there. The angels are there watching uh, what's going on, observing. The Spirit of God is there and certainly active uh, in the leading of the saints as they remember the Savior. And so it's always a good thing for us to be there as well. And so <clears throat> Thomas was absent. Now, we don't know why. Maybe he was disappointed. Maybe all his hopes had been shattered uh, by uh, the way it seemed to end. And so uh, he was not there with the disciples. And sometimes it's interesting, isn't it? When we're discouraged, we absence ourselves from the meeting. The very place where we should be to get encouragement is the last place we feel like we want to be. And so we tend to not go and we stay at home. And it is, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. There have been times when you just didn't feel like going and you were tired and you were weary and maybe you were a bit discouraged and you went and afterwards you were so thankful. It just seemed like the Lord had something to say to you. Uh, when you went. And I've experienced that many times where I didn't feel like going and went and was greatly blessed in going and gathering with the saints. Now, as we think of Thomas, uh, I want to just say that perhaps he's not appreciated as much as he ought to be. <clears throat> you see, in John chapter 11, uh, when he was going to go back into uh, to uh, Bethany, um, of course, the disciples were saying, you know, why are you going back to Jerusalem? They tried to kill you there. Why are you going back to Jude, Jude, Judea? They tried to kill you there. And Thomas said, I am willing to go and die with you there. And so Thomas clearly had courage. He, at that point, he's willing to die with the Lord in Judea. In John 14, uh, he asked the question, and oh, we're so glad that he asked the question. He was the one that asked the question, how can we know the way? 
And of course, the Lord's response was utterly marvelous. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we appreciate Thomas in the sense that, one, he's willing to die for the Lord and actually did die for the Lord. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But secondly, uh, he, he asked intelligent questions. How can we know the way? Uh, and that question, marvelous question, elicited a beautiful answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So we're grateful for Thomas in these ways. And then there's another aspect. We're going to be grateful for him in a moment, and we'll see it. But notice verse 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. And again, I'm on, I understand from the tense of the Greek here that the disciples said repeatedly, uh, the disciples kept on saying to him, we have seen the Lord. And so they were saying to him, we've seen him, we've seen him. And you can imagine they'd say this, Thomas, you really missed something. When, when we were gathered together uh, <clears throat> on that Lord's Day evening, the Lord appeared in our midst. Oh, it was marvelous. And he showed us uh, his, his hands and his side. Oh, Thomas, you really missed it. And they kept on saying it to, to Thomas. But he, in response, said to them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's quite a statement, isn't it? I want you to notice the emphasis on the will here. Unless the Lord gives the evidence that on my terms, in other words, the things that I want to see, I will not believe believe. And so it really comes down to this. His doubts were not intellectual. This is about the will, because he's saying, unless the Lord does this, this, and this, I will not believe. And there are many like him who are saying, unless the Lord does this, this, and this, I will not believe. And so the, it's the will. It's not intellectual doubt here. It's the will that's really, it's, and, and that's why we're saying t doubting Thomas perhaps is a wrong title. We're going to see how the Lord responds to him. And he's going to stress, it's not doubt. It's unbelief that is the root cause of Thomas's issue at this point. He is racked with unbelief. And so he says, I will not believe unless I see this evidence. Verse 26 it says, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within. Again, they gathered together, and it's the first day of the week. And Thomas with them, this time he's with the saints. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Again, you notice the incredible repetition Lord comes and appears amongst them. The doors are shut. So again, he is able to pass through the walls and appear amongst them. And again, he reiterates to them his peace. Peace be unto shalom, be unto you. That peace <clears throat> that is uh, he alone can give, he, he gives to them. And so <clears throat> it says then, after he's saying that, it says, then saith he to Thomas, and again, notice it's the Lord that is taking the initiative here. And <clears throat> this is so encouraging, isn't it? The Lord is taking the initiative. He says, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And so what we find here is that how startling this must have been to Thomas. First of all, the Lord, when Thomas had made this statement to the disciples, uh, unless I see this, his hands, the print of the nails, put my finger in the print of the nails, thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. The Lord was not present when he said those things. And yet, the Lord repeats almost word for word what Thomas had said. And no doubt that had a startling effect on Thomas. And he basically rebukes Thomas 
not for his doubts, but for his lack of faith. Be not faithless, but believing. In other words, the emphasis is, Thomas, it's not that you're, you have genuine intellectual doubts. It's that the, the unbelief had gripped your heart. And Scripture warns us, doesn't it, to beware an evil heart of unbelief. Don't allow that to creep into us. Don't allow circumstances, difficulties, things going on around us to cause us uh, discouragement, to bring unbelief uh, to our hearts in any way. But then we get Thomas's response, and I, I think this is a delightful response. And that's what I say. Uh, we, we, we're grateful for this, what Thomas says. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now, this is, this is just staggering in a sense, really, when you think about this. This is coming from a monotheistic Jew. Remember, uh, the Jewish people, their, if you like, creedal statement was this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You know, was the, the unity of God uh, was their, their creedal statement. This is what we believe. And of course, in, in a world of polytheistic uh, systems where there were a plethora of gods that were out there, Judaism was unique. It, it emphasized there's only one God. And yet, here is this monotheistic Jew proclaiming, based on the evidence of his resurrection, that Jesus was both his Lord and his God. Now, that's quite a statement. Now, we, we're going to mull on that, think about that. We're going to let that strike us and, and, and sink into us. But in a sense, it's not the only time where this has happened in the Gospel of John. Uh, there's been some wonderful confessions as we've gone through the Gospel of John concerning the Lord Jesus. And I want us to, to just kind of review them a moment before we look further at Thomas's statement. And so let's go back to the gospel of John chapter one. And we're going to start with John the baptizer in John chapter one and verse 34 It says, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, remember when the Lord Jesus uh, claimed to be the Son of God, they, they accused him of blasphemy. Thou being a man, makest thyself God. And so this idea of the Son of God is claiming equality with God. And yet John the baptizer makes a very clear statement I bear record, this is the Son of God. Chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And so Nathanael joins the chorus, as it were, of those willing to testify. John's Gospel, chapter 6, <clears throat> Peter, verse 69, makes this Great confession. <clears throat> Verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Look at Martha now in John 11. John 11, Verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And so now we have the confession added to that. This is number uh, six, if you like, of them, of Thomas. And then the end of this chapter, in a sense, uh, we have John, the apostle, adding to these confessions 
in verse 31, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And what John is saying, I believe this too. So here in this, in this gospel way of seven signs, and you have the seven I am statements, you have the seven testimonies of individuals who all confess that Jesus is the Son of God, therefore equal with God, therefore is God. And of course, Thomas is one of them. So, of course, um, the what's so interesting about this is the Lord Jesus does not correct Thomas when he makes this confession and says, "My Lord and my God." If the Lord Jesus was anything less than his Lord and his God, he would have vehemently rejected such uh, a confession from this man. Uh, in, in fact, he would have thought it was utter blasphemy. And again, just to show that this, this is how it would have been viewed, look at John 10 for a second. John 10 and verse 33 <clears throat> Let's just get the context here. Verse 30 uh, it says, I am my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Okay, so very clearly, it would have been absolute blasphemy for Jesus to accept this confession from Thomas if the Lord Jesus was anything less than God. And so, and again, we get evidence of this. Just look at others that um, were mistaken uh, for being God and how they responded. Look at Peter in Acts 10 in verse 26, when Cornelius, <clears throat> it says, uh, verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. Look at Acts 14. Verse 15, Acts 14, verse 15. <clears throat> well, read from verse 14. It says, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, that's that they were claimed to be gods, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities to the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And then one more reference, and this is from John the Apostle himself, Revelation 22. The revealing angel that has re revealed uh, many things to him. We read that John <clears throat> responds uh, in a way which is quite uncharacteristic. Uh, it says, verse 8 of Revelation 22, And I, John, saw these things, and I heard them. And when I heard and I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them that keep the sayings of this book, worship God." And so what we see <clears throat> is that uh, a consistency of men who and angels who refuse to be worshipped as God because God alone is to be worshipped. And yet Thomas makes this great confession where he is acknowledging that Jesus is both God his Lord and his God and the Lord Jesus accepts it. He does not in any way 
re reject what Thomas says. In fact, he, he goes a step further and he says this. In verse 29, Jesus said to Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. In other words, you, you have believed that I, because you've seen the evidence of my resurrection, you, you have believed uh, that I am Lord and God. And then he says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And so he says that for others who have never seen the evidence, who have just simply believed eyewitness testimony, how blessed are they? They have not seen these things, but they believe. What have they believed? They believe that Jesus is their Lord and their God. And he says, these people are to be congratulated. They're the truly happy men. They're incredibly blessed because having not seen, yet they have believed. In a sense, this is the high point, really, of the Gospel of John. We began with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was, was with God, the Word was God. And then we saw the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And now we have this monotheistic Jew acknowledging without question that the Lord Jesus is indeed that Word that was with God, that was God, that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And he says, my Lord and my God. And again, dispensationally, it's a picture of Israel in a coming day. This nation that still believe the Lord Jesus to be the blasphemer, to be the apostate, one day they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And that day, they are going to acknowledge that the Lord Jesus is their Lord and their God, and the nation will be born again in one day. So that brings us nicely to verse 30, where it says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And we said this is really the theme of the Gospel of John. He was quite selective. There were many signs. Matthew records 20. Mark records 18 signs. Luke records 20 signs. But John, who is much later, remember, writing much later, he's looking back, he's reviewing, he's got a very different purpose in his message, and he carefully selects seven signs chosen to prove. The five of them are unique to John, to prove without question that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so he says, he, he carefully selected these signs from the many, which are not written in his book. They're written in other places. But he says, these are written for one express purpose, that you might believe, that you might be like Thomas. In fact, not just like Thomas, but even more than Thomas, you'll be even blessed more than Thomas <laughs> because you haven't seen, but you believe in the eyewitness testimony and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. This eternal life, this, this life that is, uh, is the abundant life, is, is the, the life, the way God intended man to live, a man living with his sins forgiven, with a hope in heaven, with, with the joy of the Holy Spirit in his life, with, with a Savior that loves him and gave himself for him. This life, this is the life that is being offered to those that will believe. And how blessed are they that, having not seen, yet they believe. Now, we said we had one more little comment we wanted to make about Thomas. And again, this is not from scripture, but this is uh, historical uh, evidence that has come to us. Uh, Thomas, he took the commission, even though he wasn't there when the Lord Jesus uh, had given this particular commission. 
as my father sent me, even so send I you. Uh, he was present as the Lord gave other repetitions of the Great Commission. And he took it seriously. And he took a cargo ship to a place we now know as South India. And he began to preach in South India the gospel of the Lord Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. And, of course, uh, saw results. And yet there were many that warned him to be silent in preaching this message. And uh, his opponents were vehemently uh, against him and the message that he gave. And yet he continued to preach. And then one day they finally put him to silence. They ran a spear through his back and he was martyred in South India. But the church, which he established, is still flourishing today. And uh, we think of assembly testimony in this continent and uh, how many uh, assemblies have been strengthened by brethren from South India, from places like Kerala, uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, where the gospel was first taken uh, through the labors of Thomas, who was no longer doubting Thomas or even unbelieving Thomas, but was a Thomas who had once said to the Lord, uh, I'm willing to go to Judea and die for you. Well, he was willing to go to India and die for the Lord Jesus too. And he did. And so Thomas is a great example to us in a sense. He asked great questions. <clears throat> How can we know the way? He made a great confession of the Lord Jesus, my Lord and my God. And he laid down his life willingly uh, for the gospel's sake in taking this message, no doubt in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, to foreign lands, to a place called South India. And so, again, may the Lord encourage us this morning. Uh, we have this message still. It still is needed by sinful men. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim this message. And this message is that the Lord Jesus is none other than the Lord, and he's none other than God manifest in flesh. And he is the one that came into this world so that men could be forgiven of their sins, that died on Calvary, that was buried, that rose again the third day, and the evidence was seen. And it wasn't seen by many. In fact, the Apostle Paul would tell us that he was seen of 500 at one time. But it seems like overall, maybe that's about it. 500 people witnessed Christ risen from the dead. But millions upon millions have not seen and yet have believed. They believe the eyewitness testimony and they have been brought into fellowship with divine persons. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, and our communion is with the Holy Spirit. How did that all happen? Because we simply believed the testimony of those that saw Jesus risen from the dead. What an encouragement it is for us to think on these things. Amen. <laughs>